I am here with Meg Yuri, who is Israel Munson Professor of Physics and Astronomy and the director of the Yale Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics. We're going to be able to talk about a really fascinating subject, which is looking at women in the professional world and particularly your journey as a woman in science. And you're one of the rare people where the saying, it's not rocket science, doesn't apply. Because in your case, actually, it is that serious. So, you know, it's not that often that the average person gets to talk to um, someone where you can actually say that. And I think your perspective is going to be really valuable because in the field of rocket science, it's one of the pinnacles of expression of genius. It's where we see um, real innovation. And I think you will have a lot to offer about what it means for a woman to make her way through that kind of a field. Well, first of all, um, I guess when I was younger, I thought it was, uh, you know, a very formidable uh, enterprise. And of course, only the smartest people could do it, blah, blah, blah. But I'm here to tell you that, you know, physicists put their pants on one leg at a time. And uh, we are not uh, talking about um, uh, a profession populated with uh, geniuses. I mean, any more than any other sector of the of the society. So um, I think, I think partly, I think physicists are um, good at um, describing themselves as uh, smarter than everyone else. I mean, there's a few professions like that. I don't think physicists own the patent on, on uh, self-aggrandizement, but uh, I do think physicists think they're among the smartest people on the planet. And that's very off-putting to people who have, for whatever reason might, doubt their own abilities, perhaps. So it's kind of a set up for exclusion, set up for not taking full advantage of all the talent that's out there. Um, I think we need a little bit of a social revolution in, in science generally, I would say. I love that you start out making that point because there's data that shows us that women, if they're in a room with men, will not be the first to speak when uh, a question is asked or when a microphone is opened and people are offered the opportunity to ask questions. That uh, when applying for jobs, women in general will look to have a high percentage of the skills required for a particular job before they will put themselves forward to apply. Whereas um, men come from a different perspective. They will expect to have uh, a lower percentage of this, uh, the skills required for a job and, and feel that they're comfortable growing into it. So, you know, we know that women are compensated at lower rates than men for the same work. And here in your field, as you said, self-aggrandizement is a popular practice. It would just seem to be a barrier of entry uh, just for a woman to have the confidence to think that you could go into that field. You know, um, it's a very gendered thing, right? Uh, I have a colleague, very bright guy. We happen to be department chairs at the same time. And one day we're walking back from a meeting and he made some remark about um, how he'd been kind of under, I don't know, underperforming in college and his son was doing much better, blah, blah, blah. That's how it came out. And anyway, I, I found out he sort of had a C average in physics um, in college. And, and he went on to graduate school and has had a very successful career. He's obviously very able, but I just, I just stopped in my tracks and I stared at him. I'm like, what? You know, you have a, had a C's in physics and you went on to graduate school. That, I have women coming to my office, uh, young women who, you know, they get an A minus in a class and they decide they aren't worthy and that they can't go on. I, I mean, they've literally told me, um, you know, I'm not good enough for graduate school because I got an A minus in some class. So there's a very different um, sense of how uh, men and women look at themselves and evaluate themselves. And it isn't um, sort, of, sort of to go on to the next point. It isn't a matter of confidence. Sometimes it's framed as, you know, women aren't as confident as they need to be or whatever. It's really that our whole lives, we get negative feedback on our uh, assertions or of our 
capability in, in these male dominated professions. I mean, if women want to claim expertise in uh, traditional pursuits, like, you know, cooking, cleaning, sewing, raising children, whatever, no one's going to tell them, oh, no, you're not good at that. But if, uh, if we try to claim expertise in these fields that are owned by men, um, then we get a lot of pushback. And so we are trained through that pushback. We are trained to sort of dial back our ambitions, dial back our claims of expertise, be very cautious about how we claim expertise. And as you said, we pretty much have to be perfect before we're willing to claim expertise. Again, it's not because we lack inner confidence. It's because we know we're going to get way more pushback than a more standard person, <laughs> which is to say, you know, someone who looks much more like the all the professors in the department um, th than they would get. There's an assumption that young men are brilliant, uh, you know, with unlimited potential. And, and when we look at women or people of color or other groups that are underrepresented in a profession, uh, there's more, you know, well, what have they done? You know, how, what does their record look like? We, we're more skeptical about their, about their abilities. So I think it, it, it's, uh, it's not a surprise that, um, that we tend to um, uh, discourage people who are not already present in the room. And where's the downside of this? Uh, you know, some people say, well, gee, uh, Americans win all the Nobel prizes in science. And uh, we have some of the highest rated universities in the world in science. So uh, it would be nice to do this social engineering to, you know, open the door a, a crack wider for, uh, you know, a few lucky souls of other genders or, or uh, races. But in the end, don't we have the best system in the world? And I would say this, this is actually maybe the most important thing I could, I could offer. Um, science progresses through a clash of ideas. Uh, if you look in the mirror and you uh, try to teach yourself something, you get nowhere because you, you already know everything that that person in the mirror knows. It's only when you talk to someone who thinks differently or has a different experience or has different ideas that you spark new ideas. So I've heard you say, if I said it, it wouldn't get as noticed as it would if one of the men in the room said it. Even after a lengthy career and status as a faculty member at Yale University, you can say that a man in the room can say something, the same thing that you would say, and the man would receive more recognition for that. And I would sort of abstract that out to thinking about people of color, thinking about people of different gender identities, because it's not just about the binary gender identities of male and female, right? We're, uh, we're inclusive of a variety of different identities. And how do you know uh, that you as a woman at Yale, how do you, you know, address that? You know, I, I, I just read a, 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 the big biography of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and um, it, I, it reminded me of when she was the only woman on the Supreme Court and how her experiences informed her fellow justices' uh, ideas and opinions, that without her in the room, the conversation would have been really different. So I think, I think it's important to be in the room. And I think, um, you know, I've tried to do my part. When I, when I first came to Yale in 2001, at that time, I was the only woman on the faculty in the physics department. And I was also the first woman who was tenured in that department. Um, now we have seven women, uh, almost all of whom are tenured. And so it's really changed the department. It's changed uh, the conversation. There are things that, you know, actually go somewhere now that used to not go anywhere. So change has definitely happened. Um, but uh, sorry, going back to your question, like how to make how to make that happen. I do think numbers make a difference. But I think of all the people who haven't thrived 
in our current environment. And I see this with, um, you know, students who are, for example, students of color, we have very few in our graduate program. And so they carry an extra burden. They carry a burden of, um, of not feeling they belong, even if they arrive at Yale feeling they belong and feeling they should be here and, you know, raring to go, uh, give us a year or two and we'll erode that sense of belonging and we'll, uh, we'll manage to make them feel as if they don't belong. And I think this is something that, I don't know, I, I just think, I, I don't really blame anyone for being unaware of these problems. I think when you are surrounded by people who look and talk like you most of the time, it's hard to develop an awareness of how it feels to be an outsider. Whereas I come in, you know, as a woman in physics, I've been an outsider my entire life in the, in the physics world. And so while I'm not a person of color and uh, I'm, you know, I, I identify cisgender female, I still think I have a little bit of an insight into how it feels to be, you know, othered. And, um, and so I, I am aware of what that students need, like extra encouragement and, and, you know, help being put into study groups, for example, but, you know, people are left out of study groups because they don't fit the, the mold. So I, I think there are, as Ruth Bader Ginsburg did, you know, she brought her experience to the Supreme Court and she tried to explain to her colleagues you know, what it was like and what obstacles women faced and what the consequences were. And I guess I would say I'm trying to do the same thing in physics, you know, here, here's how this impacts students. And, um, and also what are the consequences for our science? I can give you a concrete example. I mean, these are kind of abstract concepts, but over the last couple of years, we've been discussing the graduate record exam and whether to, you know, uh, particularly in light of the pandemic, whether to suspend uh, requiring GRE scores. And at one point in the discussion, I won't go through the whole thing, it's a big topic, but um, some of us remarked that it's expensive to take these exams and that, you know, it's, it's a problem for some people to take these exams as a result. And somebody else said, oh, but it's only, you know, one or two hundred dollars. And I thought, okay, that's a perfect example of where this disconnect is. You know, tenured professors for whom one or $200 is not a big amount of money are failing to understand how one or $200 for a, an undergraduate of no particular means and without family wealth uh, is a lot of money. So it's a matter of perspective and a matter of empathy really. Um, and trying to understand where other people are coming from. And I think that's important, particularly because as we're talking about genius and finding the geniuses in our society, that everyone needs to have a level playing field at expressing their genius. And that's really what you're talking about. Are the gatekeepers who are able to provide the resources and the environment for a person to explore their interests and their passions uh, such that they may become a genius or they may manifest a genius idea. Are those gatekeepers really making it possible for everyone to have a, lay, a level playing field? It seems like gatekeepers really not having a sense of the potential that exists in communities that look like them is a problem. And I think you've rightly pointed out that the more women who make their way through those gates, uh, the more that doors are open for others. But how we get women to feel entitled or inspired to take on the challenges to go through those gates, that's a question. And I would like to look for answers to that question in your own story, in terms of what made you go down that path and really feel drawn to pursue a career as an astrophysicist, uh, yeah, I would really love to hear your story on that. Yeah, so let me first say, first of all, amen to what you said. 
Um, I, I really worry. Uh, I mean, we have this, this, this idea that we live in a meritocracy where geniuses will just float to the top and, um, you know, all will be well. And I worry a lot about all the untapped geniuses out there, that the, the, the brilliance, the, the ideas, the, you know, the solutions to today's problem, particularly if we're talking about STEM, uh, you know, technical scientific issues are staring us right in the face all the time. Big, big problems uh, from climate change uh, to, uh, uh, to pandemics and, and beyond. And, uh, and we need all the talent that's out there. So yes, I think this is a really critical idea that um, it is not the case that, you know, all Einstein's toiling in the customs uh, uh, house will, will uh, manage to publish their, their new ideas. Uh, uh. So how did I get here? I think I got here in spite of everything. I think I, I had a really supportive family. My father was a professor of chemistry. And that role model, you know, the seeing that being a professor was actually a thing uh, that you know ordinary mortals could become, and um, and both of both my parents were college educated, although they were the first in their uh, families to go to college, um, and they, they 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 were sure their children were of course going to college and then to graduate school. So we had a strong push from my parents and a lot of support and. Um, they never said, you know, girls don't do this, as, as some of my contemporaries uh, were told. I have colleagues who, in astronomy uh, and elsewhere, who, uh, one of whom didn't have a middle name because, of course, she was going to get married, so she didn't need a middle name. She would just, you know, add her husband's name. Another one who um, was a National Merit Scholarship finalist, but uh, no, she, she wasn't going to get her college paid for by her family because they needed to save their money for the two her two younger brothers. I mean, uh, it was just common for women to be discriminated against. And I had a very fortunate situation with my family, um, both in terms of you know their uh, uh, profound respect for education and their encouragement for everything I did. So I, in my family, I was one of four kids. We're all sort of sciencey, actually. My sister's a professor of biology. My younger sister is a an uh, art conservationist, which involves a lot of science, and my brother's a mechanical engineer. So we all kind of went that way. So how did it happen? I'll just tell you. I mean, yeah, I'll just give you like the 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 32nd version. Um, I'm in college. I was taking physics because I guess my dad said I should take physics. And it's the first course I ever had trouble with. I, I never studied, right? I never read a textbook. And suddenly I'm in class and I qu didn't quite know what was going on. And um, uh, this is when we were studying electricity and magnetism. I got the mechanics stuff okay, which is what you learn first, but the electricity and magnetism, I had no intuition for it. And I bombed a test. I'd never bombed a test in my life. So anyway, it was a big, it was a big shock to the system. And I, I sort of had a decision point at that point. I could either say, well, physics is not for me, as perhaps many, many um, others have done, both men and women, frankly. Or I thought to myself, come on. You know, I'm smart. This cannot be that hard. Uh, I'm just, you know, I just have to figure it out. And I did. And I think that, you know, uh, hitting the books and, and teaching it to myself, essentially, I think I, I sort of felt good about that, that, oh, yeah, this isn't that hard. It's actually pretty, pretty beautiful. And that's when I got interested. And then the other big, big um, key point was when I had my first research experience. I had a summer job doing research at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. And that was the first time I understood that you could, I mean, people were actually getting paid to do this really cool stuff, like, you know, figure out what's out in the universe and where quasars are and how they're powered by black holes. I mean, I came home from that summer, like, this is what I have to do. This is just too much fun. And I didn't realize it was even a thing. So, um, so that's how I got into it. I was just super charged, super excited about, about what I was doing. Um, and then, as I say, the whole rest of it, the whole career is kind of like forging ahead despite all of the unpleasantnesses I encountered. So you're describing a few things. You're describing resilience. Uh, I think first and foremost, uh, resilience throughout, um, especially as you encounter material that's intimidating, 
that you can't immediately sort of instinctively master and and having the resilience to double down on your focus until you did master it. And you're also describing a certain amount of self-determining belief, belief that the strength of your passion for the topic is going to carry you through the challenges that you may have with it. And I think the last thing that really stands out in your story is uh, the role of your parents and the sense that your parents gave you that you could do it because they did it. And there was a point where uh, you said that they expected this of you. So it's interesting. We've learned in this course that parents can be the first influencers of a gendered sense of entitlement or empowerment. So the Google search for, is my son a genius? Compared to the Google search for, is my daughter gifted? The numbers are overwhelmingly in favor of parents looking for their sons to be extraordinarily bright. And they're, and they're asking, are their daughters overweight, right? That's the, <laughs> that's the standard question. And so I wonder, you know, every parent who aspires for wonderful things for their kids would love to have a Yale professor say, this is what I think you should know about how to encourage your child. What would you, what would you tell parents? Yeah, I think this is super important. I'll tell you, um, so my kids are getting this, uh, my kids are grown now, but they got the same treatment of expectations and, um, you know, what is that A minus doing on your report card kind of feedback. Um, But I vividly remember my youngest daughter, I have two daughters, uh, coming home from school one day, I think she must have been in about third grade. And she she just casually said, yeah, yeah, I'm not very good at math. And I kind of hit the roof. I, you know, I'm like, what are you talking about? I said, you're the smartest kid in your class. You're very good at math. Blah, 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 blah. I went on for five minutes on a rant. And when I finally shut up, she was kind of sitting there, you know, <laughs> a little shocked at the reaction. Uh, and she never said that again. And she always did super well in math. And she, you know, but I, I had that, but then I had a realization. Um, I'm, I'm a scientist and I'm very good at math. So I had that reaction because I know she's very smart at math and can do it and so on. But suppose I were not good at math. Suppose I had been a student who hadn't gotten gotten it. Um, Maybe my reaction would have been, probably would have been, I think my reaction would have been to say, that's okay, honey. Uh, You're really good at English or something else. I would have been trying to protect her from feeling bad, you know, about something. Um, But I would have maybe bought into this idea that she couldn't do it, that there's somehow a gendered difference between boys and girls in math, which, by the way, is baloney. Um, And it it also, if I can just return for a minute to that physics class in college and the idea of resilience, you know, it was not hard, that material that I was learning. And what the reason I had trouble with it was that no fault of his, but the professor was not speaking to me. He was not explaining it in a way that I grasped it. Um, he was explaining in a way that probably worked for him as an undergraduate, you know, that, 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 that addressed his blocks. Um, and so that's why another reason it's so important to diversify, diversify the workplace, the, the academic workplace, is that Different people have different educational experiences and they will they will understand more about different kinds of students and what they do and don't get. And, um, you know, going going back to my daughter and her math thing, uh, it, if you don't understand something, it doesn't mean you're not good at it. It just means somebody hasn't taught it to you well. There's nothing that they're teaching in third grade math or in introductory physics that, um, you know, that kids, that anyone can't understand. There's no one I couldn't teach introductory physics to. It, everyone can learn that. It is not, there's not a, a, a gene that says you can't learn physics. It's, but somehow we approach it as, oh, the students who do well are smart, and the ones who don't do well just can't hack it. That's just not true. 
Uh, so I think parents need to, um, they need to, I mean, I'm not saying everyone has to learn physics. If you don't like it, that's fine. There are many other interesting things, but, but it, we shouldn't take, we should encourage our, our children and our students to learn everything they can learn and to, and to realize everything is learnable. And if they can't understand it, they should be asking questions that, that, that helps you know, bring out a different way of a different explanation or another path to understand. I think there's something else that you pointed out in your example about your daughter, your hypothetical uh, story about your daughter, that you might have sympathized with her if you also were not good at math, which is that oftentimes parents want to sympathize and support their daughters. Um, but the son gets a lot of more sort of toughen up and get out there and try again uh, messaging. And, well, you know, um, there's only one. Well, I'm just thinking there's a, a parallel to this, which I think happens farther along in the career part, where boys really are expected to have a career in life. And uh, girls have not only, of course, they could have a career and often, you know, people pay good lip service to that, but they're often encouraged to quit working and raise a family as their primary concern, you know, once they're out of college. And um, this differential pressure, the pressure on men to stay on the career path and the pressure on women to get off the career path is kind of the equivalent of what you're talking about at the school children stage. It creates, again, a difference and also a, a certain amount of doubt. I think probably both men and women have doubt about themselves and their abilities all the time. But for, for men, they, they, they can't admit it. They can't allow it. It, it. it can't be a topic of any conversation because they have to succeed. They have to have a profession. And women are encouraged to doubt, you know, should I do this? Or maybe I should just, uh, you know, maybe I should just get married and have children and that could be my thing and whatever. And, and so there, they are, it's like turbulence, you create turbulence in their brains uh, to distract from, you know, what they should be doing. I'm not saying either of these is a good thing. I think having fixed roles is, you know, uh, well, it's not, I think people should go and do what they are best at and most interested in, whatever. But the, um, this differential uh, uh, treatment by gender is very much uh, contributing to the uh, attrition of women from uh, STEM professions and to uh, the, the dominance of men in those professions. Well, yeah, I'm glad you make that point because we ended our last session with the observation that in some ways we have as a society, um, we've removed some barriers against equal recognition and opportunity for women's uh, accomplishments. But in other ways in our culture, particularly in Western culture, women are still the primary caregivers for children and the bond between parent and child is still primarily seen as the purview of the woman. And I think things have changed tremendously over the past 50 years, and especially now, again, looking at a more open dialogue about the variety of gender identities that people have and the roles that they may serve in the family. But there's still this idea that somehow there's a mother and the mother's job is to nurture the child first and foremost. And that's going to eclipse her career aspirations. Um, do you think we could ever get away from that? Well, I think we can, but I, I think we're no, nowhere near getting away from it now. I, I you know, again, my students, um, you know, I, I, I talk to them and I ask them about about this stuff. I remember one time there was an, um, this is about 15 years ago, there was an article in the New York Times front page about how Ivy League women were just going to get married and, you know, quit their professions. Um, it was based on a survey, including Yale students, um, 
about what their plans were. And I found it quite um, reactionary. So I, I, I was at that time teaching a huge intro physics class and we were using clickers, you know, where you can answer questions uh, with a little electronic polling device. So I went in and I said, um, and I always at the beginning of class always asked an attendance question that wasn't wasn't physics just for fun. So I said, I'm going to ask you about this article that just, you know, which many of them had seen. So I asked them, um, what are your thoughts about having a family? And we had five buttons on the clicker. So I said, haven't thought about it. Uh, I've thought about it and not going to have kids. And then the other three were, uh, I'm going to have kids and I'll be the primary caregiver. I'm going to have kids and I'll be the uh, my, my partner will be the primary caregiver. And the last one was we'll share equally. So I, I asked the girls and the boys separately to answer, but 45 women answered. Um, all, almost all of them had thought about it and were going to have kids. And uh, I, more than half thought they were going to share equally with their partners. And the men, mostly many hadn't thought about it. Um, but of the ones who had, they were sure their partner was going to take care of the kids. So it was really interesting, um, and this still happens. I I, uh, I had some it, some students once telling you know thinking about their future profession ten years down the line. That is, they were going to go to medical school and they were going to become specialists, but they were going to become specialists that where they could work part time. They worked it all out because it was you know they were going to get married and they were going to have kids. These women had not even had a boyfriend yet, right? They hadn't even met a guy that they might consider having a family with, but they were sure they were going to guide their professional ambitions to fit inside this envelope of being the primary caregiver. And I was just floored by this. The, the guys never think about this. Um, I give a lot of talks about women in STEM. And afterwards, I often get asked by young women, uh, is it possible to have a career and have a family? Uh, there's a long answer to that, which I won't give you here. Never once have I been asked that by a man, never once, because they don't think about it. It doesn't occur to them that it's not possible to have a career in a family. <laughs> you know, it's just, it is what happened. And of course, all the polls show that women do most of the housework. The pandemic has been a really eye-opening uh, eye opening moment for many women uh, who be instantly became essentially stay-at-home moms maybe with also with a full-time profession on the side. So it's, um, we're not, we have not grappled with this at all. And, you know, uh, we have this uh, so-called, uh, so-called uh, second infrastructure bill, which actually addresses things like child quality child care. And uh, is this a priority? You know, you, you look at, look at universities, universities uh, provide a lot of benefits for their employees, for their faculty. And they provide things like college tuition for the kids or dental plans or vision plans or health care or whatever. They don't do anything big about child care. They were way behind with maternity leave, with uh, child care. Why? Because most of the professors are not asking for it. Why? Because there are men and they have wives who are taking care of that. So we are just not at the we are not at the point where the people making the big decisions, I look at Congress, mostly men, um, mostly wealthy men, where the people making the decisions have a sense of what the needs actually are. If we wanted to make, you know, going to the genius idea, if we wanted to take advantage of all the intelligence out there, all of the talent out there, wouldn't we make it possible for people to not simultaneously be worrying about uh, whether their kids are, are you know, being educated in a decent, in a decent uh, environment. We, should, we would have universal pre-K. We would have uh, um, quality standards for child care and subsidies for child care. These would be high priorities. If men were the primary caregivers, this would have been done ages ago. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to explain that to us. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, it's, I'm, it's out of my lane, actually. No, I think that's the point, is that we hear this across the board, no matter the discipline of the speaker, that women really feel very strongly that there are some basic issues that could address leveling the playing field. And the bottom line is that women make up 50% of the global population. It's just sort of basic numbers. Births divide up. 
50-50, male, female. How people self-identify as they mature is a different story, but you have about half of the human population at a disadvantage culturally for expressing their genius. And I think that that's, uh, that's really the point that you're making. Yeah. There's a, there's a wonderful article um, that I mentioned to Craig that about um, written by Linda Notchlin about, uh, it's called why, why are there no famous women artists? And um, uh, this stemmed out, actually a colleague of mine in physics told me, you know, of course there are no great women in art because women aren't great artists, full stop. And so that got me thinking about it. And I eventually stumbled on this article and found it. And it, it really is about opportunity. It's about uh, what you're allowed to do in, in a society where women, uh, you know, perhaps can't go out unaccompanied, uh, who fear for their safety if they're, if they're un, uh, you know, unprotected in a public space, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many, so many obstacles to open expression of talent, um, that it really is a miracle that there have been so many women geniuses. Part of it is they get erased, right? That you, uh, Pauli Murray is a great example. Um, uh, when, when Yale named a college after Pauli Murray, I mean, frankly, I said, who is that? I, don't, I didn't know her. I didn't know anything about her. Uh, I've since read quite a bit. I read her autobiography. There's now a Netflix, um, Netflix, I think, movie or Amazon uh, movie about her life. She's an amazing person. Why didn't I know about her? Uh, or uh, Constance Motley Baker. Why didn't I know about her? Uh, there's so many amazing women that we are just allowed to forget. We, we, we're reminded of people like Betsy Ross. You know, I read a biography of Betsy Ross when I was a kid, but why didn't I read about uh, these uh, civil rights leaders and uh, uh, gender equity activists and and genius scientists from the 1800s, from the 1900s. Why, why didn't I learn about that? I want to drill in on Polly Murray for just a moment because I think Polly Murray is such a fascinating example. We know Polly as a great legal mind, strategist, one of the first African-American women to be ordained by the Episcopal Church, named a saint in the Episcopal Church, one of the first African-Americans to graduate from the Yale Law School with the equivalent of a PhD. And yet, as we look into her writings, we find out that Polly really didn't identify as female, although she used female pronouns for herself there wasn't an alternative at that time. And she identified as what she referred to as a female or a male in a female body, um, but certainly an accomplished thinker and scholar. And I wonder what you think about the ways in which her gender struggles influenced her accomplishments. Well, I, I you know, I'm, I, I read songs in a weary throat which are it's about her upbringing, uh, but with her, by her two aunts in um, in uh, South Carolina, South Carolina, I think North Carolina. Uh, so the impression I had was that um, overwhelmingly her race determined her early trajectory. She had a lot of trouble um, getting a good education. Uh, uh, trying to be admitted to college, be admitted to law school, and, and all of those objections had to do with race. And, and often um, the peril she was in had to do with race uh, and the, you know, height of Jim Crow um, in the South. So, but also in New York City when she lived there. Um, uh, in, her, in that book, she did not talk a lot about um, the non-binary uh, self-image. And so I don't really know what she thought about it. I'm, I'm certain that based on, you know, having seen um, the world around me and how, how people with non-binary identities are treated in, in spaces where uh, everyone else is uh, cisgender, 
uh, normative. It's it's very difficult, right? You're the odd one out, and people can't see you as it's it's the same as um, well, it's not the same. Uh, forgive me, but you know when you're the odd one out, it almost doesn't matter what the what the reason is. If if you're the only woman in the physics class, if you're the only LGBTQ person in the um, in your major, if you're the only uh, religious person in a sea of atheists, if you're the only military veteran in uh, a class of you know much younger uh, uh, people who've never served in the military, you can't be seen as a, a full member of, of the group or as someone who, who is on the path to become. You need some kind of validation and or role models ahead of you. And the, actually one of the true genius parts of, of Polly Murray was that she managed to excel at everything she did uh, in spite of in tremendous discouragement and, and having been overlooked. I mean, there were times when she didn't have enough money to eat or pay rent. Uh, uh, and she just was hand to mouth working this or that job. This is something that most of us, um, you know, in a traditional academic setting didn't have to deal with. She, 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 nothing stopped her. She just went forward with what she believed. Um, so hugely, I just, it's a hugely admirable, but also shouldn't be necessary. That is, um, most of us would fail that test. Most of us wouldn't have achieved what she achieved, even with, let's say, similar talent. But somehow her, her drive and her, you know, just refusal to, 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 to deviate from what she thought was right to do is, um, I mean, it's a remarkable thing. But think about a world in which that's not necessary, in which people can can become what she became without those obstacles. If we took away the obstacles, if we took away the friction, the, we would have incredible results, incredible productivity, incredible explosion of knowledge and ideas and functionality and success. Um, at, at, at a small cost, all we need to do is open our eyes and recognize there's not a pattern. You know, you don't have to fit a certain template. You don't have to fit the template of who's already there in order to fill the shoes of who's already there in whatever arena. Wise words from a Yale professor of astrophysics. Thank you so much, Meg. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you, Lauren. I really enjoyed talking to you.